Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan and Steve here on a new episode of Yes Shift with a guest who you may be familiar with. If not, put your head down for a five minute timeout. After the interview, we're introducing to you Oliver Wakeman, whose work we're a big fan of. Steve's in Bakersfield, California. I'm in Globe, Arizona, 100 miles east of Phoenix. And Oliver is at home in Chaltam, England, out in the countryside. I'm in the countryside too, Oliver. We, uh, my wife and I had an effort moment a few years ago and moved out of the city up into the mountains. It's, it's a lot better, isn't it? It's, it's, that's quite nice, actually. We don't have mountains where we are. We've got a hill. That, a hill? <laughs> Is there a hobbit under the hill? <laughs> no, no, actually, I wouldn't say. Um, <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, it's all right. It's a long, long day, but I'm doing, I'm doing well. I'm well thank you for it, taking so, um, time, yeah, especially in the evening. We are there That's in the all right. UK. So, Steve, why don't you kick it off? Yeah, so uh, we'll be talking about, um, well, we have like a few different things we want to touch upon. Obviously, you have your upcoming box set collaborations yeah. fe featuring the three ages of magic, which you did with Steve Howe, and Ravens and Lullabies, which you did with Gordon Giltrap. Um, and... It also includes a bonus live album from a stage. And I, I guess one of the things I was wondering is, um, well, like who comes up with the idea of making, of proposing the box set? And also, is there a video component? We really loved the video of the concert we saw on your YouTube channel. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start with the box set bit. Um, well, I'd, I'd imagine the majority of your audience, uh, I'd like to think that they're aware of the From a Page record, which yeah. came out in 2019. Um, so that was a, a sort of compilation of my time with the, with Yes from 2008 to 2011. So that box set came out and I'm so, I worked with the Yes management as, as well. So they were very pleased with how that went. Um, and I think it took a lot of people by surprise uh, just... A, because we announced it without telling anybody. Uh, and secondly, <laughs> because people were quite surprised that the, the, the quality and the, uh, you know, the depth of the material that was there, which was was very rewarding. So that that went down very well. And then they they came to me and they said, that, that went really well. I said, yeah, yeah, good. And they said, got anything else? And I said, well, and I had a couple of albums, which I'd recorded with Clive Nolan, who some of your, your listeners may know is a, a great keyboard player and singer and songwriter. And... and um, we had done two albums together in the late 90s, early noughties, and we'd started work on a third record, which we'd never never really got very far with. Anyway, I, I mentioned these records to the, rec uh, to the management company, and they said, oh, yeah, let's do that. So I put that one together, and then they did their traditional thing of saying, yeah, that's great, but anything else? And I said, well, we did have this third album that we'd started. And so they said, well, can you do a third disc of, of that stuff? And I thought, yeah, that's much better than just doing a disc which is just full of demos, which is, I know they're really interesting. And I, I do like a, a good demo. I mean, I'm I'm a sucker for that. Like yeah, anybody I, else. I this, love demos. Yeah, it's yeah, a great behind like, the scenes. It's like almost a documentary element, it, you know. It is. But then I sort of thought, does somebody really want to listen to me sing a song when Bob Catley sung it? And I thought, nah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, and we had enough material that we realized when we went through our folders, we each said, oh, I think I've written one, maybe two pieces for this project, which was Frankenstein that we never finished. And we both went through and realized we had about 35, 40 minutes. And then I had about three pieces that we hadn't used on the Hound record. So I said this to the record company. I said, well, we can do that. And they were so pleased with it that they then put it out as a, a standalone release as well, which was great. So, of course, when that box set sold well, they came to me and said, all right, what next? <laughs> and I said, okay. So I sort of had a look at the catalogue of work that I've done. Now, I know, you know, a lot of Yes fans, are, they're sort of rabid Yes fans. They love all the Yes stuff. But, you know, the Yes family tree is so extensive and it's oh, yeah. so, the, the, you know, the branches go far and wide that it's very difficult to keep track of what everybody's done outside of the, uh, outside of the band. And so I was. It's hard thinking, enough to keep track of what everyone's done inside the band. So. That's true. <laughs> so you're yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was thinking, okay, well, so I was looking through my my catalog, and I was thinking, well, I've done quite a lot of records now. So, uh, and I was looking through them. And some of the some of them are solo instrumental records. Some of them are new age records. Some of them were 
sort of big prog records. Um, there was the records I did with Clive, and then there were some rock band albums as well and stuff. And I was sort of going through it and I was thinking, how do these package together? What's the next thing that I think would be really interesting? And I, I got asked to do a um, interview for a, a documentary on Peter Banks. And I was sitting there oh, wow. talking about Peter Banks because Peter Banks played on our Jabberwocky and the Hound albums that were in the box that I just mentioned. Right. And um, I sort of thought, oh, I've been really lucky. I'm not. I'm one of the, you know, one of the, I mean, there are a few other people, but I'm one of the few people that's played with Peter Banks or worked with Peter Banks and Trevor Rabin by playing with him at the, the Greek in, in LA when he joined us on stage. And um, and Steve Howe and I sort of thought, oh, so I played with quite some really nice, nice prog guitarists. Then of course I played with Gordon as well. And I sort of thought, hang on, right. I've done an album with Gordon and an album with Steve. Maybe that's a box set. And I was thinking about calling it guitarists, and I thought, well, that'll look odd if it's my <laughs> name. People know me as a keyboard player, and I put guitarists. And so I thought, what else is it? I said, well, they were collaborate, and I thought, oh, collaborations, I like that. And. Uh, they're quite different albums. And so that yeah. those two seem to sit together. So I mentioned this to the to the management company and they said, oh, that's good, yeah. And I thought, wait for it. And they said, got anything else that can go in there? <laughs> and it was like, okay. And I was sitting there thinking, okay, I've got some, you know, some bootleg live recordings that Gordon and I did. And I've probably got a couple of bits of music that Gordon and I didn't do. And then sort of fortuitously, an email landed in my inbox from uh, a friend of mine who had, decided to, to sound engineer one of the shows that we'd done. And it had, turned out it was a show that we did with Paul Manzi. So Gordon and I used to go out as a duo. We then did a full band tour. But very occasionally, Paul Manzi would join us to do a trio show. They only happened like once or twice. And we sort of generally rehearsed in the afternoon and then did the show. And fortuitously, it was one of those shows that he'd recorded. And so I said, well, yeah, send me the stuff through thinking, mm, what's it going to be like? And it was actually a full multi-track, so I could actually have full control over it. And oh, I actually wow. sort of went through it and I thought, this is lovely. And I had the whole show, all the chat, everything. And wow. it was like, that was great. So I thought, okay, so how can I put this live record together? And I thought, I'd, you know, I was thinking about a live record title and I was, you know, Ravens Live and all sort of stuff. And then I sort of thought, oh, really, it's from a stage. And I thought, oh, I quite like that. That says got a ring to it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so I went. So I went. Okay, from a stage, we'll call it that. And um, and the good thing about the tour that I did with Gordon was, is that we didn't play lots and lots and lots from the Ravens and Lullabies album. We played um, pieces from our back catalogue because we both had quite extensive back catalogues. So this live album actually only probably features about three or four songs that are on the the, the other records in the box set. Other than that, they're pieces from all of our our histories. So it made it a really a really nice record to put in there as a third sort of unreleased disc uh and it was you know it was it, it was odd really because you're sat here listening to a live show of you that, that i did but i did it it was probably about nine years ago so i was sitting there like an audience member going does this work is this good i like that bit does that bit good should i take that bit of chat out you know so it was actually a really yeah. sort of nice period you know because normally you finish tour you listen to the live recordings and you've just played the song 40 times every night. You're like, oh, God, I've got to listen to it again. Whereas <laughs> this was quite nice. It was like, you know, nine years later and I could listen to it almost with a fan's ear and go, oh, does that work as the, as the flow? Yeah, so it came together really well. That's great. It also makes for not only a very robust package musically and volume wise, no pun intended, but it's also some nice cross sections of an entire collective anthology which mm. shows off a lot more different flavors and colors musically. So it's a great idea. You get to another box yeah. set soon? <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's still some other albums left over. So yeah, I've, there's got to be stuff laying around, right? There always I, I started work on the next one, which will hopefully be next year. I've sort of seemed to got into this habit of doing one every year. So um, yeah. the next one will probably be a collection of the band stuff I've done. You know, my, my solo records are just my name and with me and my band. So that'll be quite good fun. So I'll... I have to start digging around and see what I've got knocking around for that one. Yeah, when Steve sent me um, the uh, the video, which was um, an audience shot video of you. Oh, and looking Huntington for an image. Pool. Yeah, yeah of, uh, with you and Gordon. It just the music is so beautiful. Have you the, have the two of you done or talked about doing motion picture soundtrack work? Um. No, we haven't actually. What what happened with Gordon was is that he, he phoned me up 
when after I after I finished with Yes, he was the first person that phoned me up, and um, he said, "Oh, would you play on my record?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, fine, great, love to." And then the next day, he phoned me up again and said, um, "Look, I've changed my mind." And I went, "Oh, that's a shame." And he said, "No, no, no, I want us to work on a record together." And so we started working on a record together, and um, you know, I've been very fortunate that we were able to write it every single way. You know, we we played it live, we talked about it, we sat in a room together, we shared files over the internet, we sat in a studio recording, writing as we went. So we we were working on this album, and then he said, "Look, would you like to get on tour before we release it?" And I thought, "Well, that's a really good idea because we can work some of the material out on tour, which would be really good fun. We can we can see what bits work and." When you're playing a song over and over again, and it's just the two of you, you really start to refine the parts that work as a performance. Uh, and so when we were going out on, on tour, we started doing all these bits and it, it sort of really helped the record along. Bit of an explanation of the record here, really, because the second record in the box set is called Ravens and Lullabies. Ravens and Lullabies, so essentially Ravens are rock songs, lullabies are instrumental duets. And essentially it is um so full band song duet full band song duet and it came from a thing that years ago my dad used to say to me so when he's on stage he always does lots of talking and he says it's almost because the music is quite complex and people need to absorb a lot and he said and if you just jump from one complex piece to another complex piece to another complex piece people will tend to go oh i'm being hit with too much to almost take it on board right. he said so when you just chat and talk to the audience and engage it's a little bit like palate cleansing. You're giving them a chance to prepare for the next piece of music to listen to. Yeah. And I always, I always remembered that. And I thought, well, that's some, you know, some, you know, I've, I've done records where it's rock songs all the way through, but I sort of thought I really quite like that idea of taking a rock song that's got a, a theme or a story behind it and then interdispersing with these gentler pieces that mean that you sort of get this nice sort of flow through the record. Absolutely. Uh, and it, and it was also something Steve and I had talked about for doing for the Yes record before um, it turned, you know, Trevor Horn uh, got involved. That was originally the Yes uh, plan to do something a bit like Fragile. So I had these sort of two ideas knocking around in my head and it, it seemed to work really well. Um, so I will get to your answer, I promise. Um, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so as we were, as we were touring, we, we toured a lot. We tour, you know, we did a tour, two, three tours a year, and the record came out, and then we did various tours. Uh, and then Gordon got quite sick, um, very sick, in fact. Uh, luckily, he'd made a full recovery, but it, wow. it, it, it meant he had to really cut back on his work. So that's why we ended up stopping sort of working together, and he needed wow. to work at a different pace. Uh, otherwise, I think we would have carried on doing lots more. Um, but, you know, I, I think... You know, if anybody wants me to do a film, I'll do a film. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 <laughs> I did one actually. I did do one. Did you? What I was did, it? It was um, you know, Rodney Matthews, the artist. I did yeah. his album Trin yeah. Trinity. He did it. He's just done an animated film, and I did the oh. soundtrack for that. Nice. So yeah, that. so that's that's hopefully coming out soon. Uh, I, I I did very well actually. I've got a couple of soundtrack awards for it, which was very very pleasant. That's great. There's a story behind that one as well, but I could be here all night otherwise. You probably got... <laughs> we'll have you on again. I know there's just so much to talk about. We don't want to keep you too late. We do have a, I'm looking at the a couple notes here. We do have quite a few other things to cover, but we'll do it all within your comfort zone with the time that That's you okay. have. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually have the clip you sent us of November Wedding, which she did with Rodney Matthews. Um, yeah. So. That was... Do you want me to tell you about that one quickly or are you playing Yeah, tell it? us about that and then we're going to play you, some of it for everybody. I'll tell you that quickly. Basically, Rodney Matthews is, um, I mean, every, prog fans know who Rodney Matthews is. Or, or if they don't, look him up and you will be astounded. He's a, he's an, a phenomenal artist. He's also a sort of, he was also in a, a drummer many years before. He played at, um, I think it was Glastonbury. He played, he even supported Yes once years oh, ago. Wow. Years ago, back in the, like the late sixties, um, but then he went down the art route, and that became his career. But he was always sort of like a you know a drummer at heart, and um, he'd been working on writing little themes and songs for an album over like forty years. And he came to me and said, "Oh, would you um, play on my record?" And I said, "Yeah, of course I would." And I ended up playing on nearly every track, writing a few pieces, doing a lot of arrangements for it. Um, and in the meantime. When I first got back in touch with, with Rodney, I have a long history with Rodney. Um, 
but I, I hadn't spoken to him for a long time. And then he, he, he got it back in touch with me. His, his wife passed away mm. and, and he was sort of getting himself back on his feet. And then he thought, I'm going to do the record. I'm going to do the record. And in the meantime, he met a new, a new lady. Um, and then they got married and he invited me to, to go to the wedding, which is up in Scotland. And he said, would you perform at our wedding for us? And I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So, I went up there and I played in the church for as, as, as his wife, Sarah, walked down the aisle and I played some music in, in while the people were waiting and I played music at the end of it. And then in the evening, I did a piano show for them. And I was sort of, just before I went up there, my wife and I were talking and we thought, what can we, what can we get them? What do you get? A fantasy artist. What do you, you know, what do you buy? You have to buy him something and he's going to go, well, that's really nice. You know, because he can draw anything, make anything. And I thought, well, that's really difficult. And he's not really going to want a gravy boat. So I thought, well, what can I do? And I thought, well, I'll write him a piece of music for his wedding. And his wedding was in November. So that's where the, the, the name November Wedding comes from. And I thought I would just play it for him at the wedding in, in, the, in the evening session. I, they, you know, lots of music I was playing from different records. And then I thought, well, I'm just going to play it to them. And I played it and the sort of room erupted at the end and Rodney just pointed at me and said, that's going on the album. Oh, wow, and that's so, great. <laughs> yeah, and so it was a, it was a, lovely, a lovely piece. Um, uh, and so that's really the hit, that's the story behind November Wedding. And the Trinity album that it appears on, which is the record he did with Jeff Sheets, the uh, guitarist, and, and mm -hmm. with me, um, every piece of music on that record is based on one of his paintings. And November Wedding was the, was the, the odd one out because he had to actually paint a picture to go with the piece of music. So we actually, that was the only piece the other, way the, other way, the other way around. But yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a fun piece. That's great. Let's bring some of it up, folks. Check this out. This is Oliver Wapen with November Wedding. It's great. Beautiful. That must have been fun. How, how, if you don't mind me asking Oliver, how, how long did it take for you to work that out? And did you work it out first on paper, so to speak, or by just letting it flow out of you onto the keys? Oh, was so letting it flow. It came quite quickly, actually. Um, the, the, I sort of, what generally happens is I come up with a theme that I really like, uh, and then I work loads of stuff around it. And then generally the piece just develops and develops and develops. And then I keep refining it. And then what, what often happens is the bit that inspired me in the first point gets binned because the rest of it has actually developed much better. So the original idea sort of almost gets buried. Um, and I think on that one, the middle section sort of came a little later because I wanted to do a little reflection bit in the middle. Uh, and I think I wrote sort of fast ending because I, I just wanted to do variations on the end. Um, but I wanted it to finish with that sort of, you know, very upbeat sort of tempo because it was a wedding. It was supposed to be a joyous, fun occasion. And um, yeah, I, I think that one, it was generally quite quick. I mean, I, pieces of music, I never sort of determine whether a piece of music is very good or bad or whether it's worth doing by the length of time it takes me, really. I remember Elton John saying, if your piece doesn't come right for him within 20 minutes, he, he thinks it's no good. Whereas I've got pieces of music that I started 10 years ago um, and they just don't find a home. I, there's a little bit in the song, uh, Is This the Last Song I Write from the Ravens record, which actually came from a song idea, which I wrote back in like 2000 or 1998. And it just, it never had a home. And then when this song came, I thought, oh, it, I saw, almost started singing it by, by accident. I went, oh, I've, I've got something like that. And it was, and then I sort of re, you know, stripped out a load of it. And, and the, but it, it just worked really perfectly. So I just sort of almost think to myself, Sometimes a piece will come quickly. There's a track called Picture of a Lady that's on the Hound of the Baskervilles album that 
almost took the length of time it is, the song is, to write it. It just came really quickly. There's nice. a track called The Agent of My Mother's Rune album, which is about a seven minute piece of music. And one bit in the middle, there's like a little rant section. And that just flew out of me. It just came bit by bit by bit. One night, I just couldn't come away from the piano. Ideas just kept coming and coming. There's a track called The Healer off of Three Ages of Magic, where I sat there one day and the bass player that worked on the record was sat with me. And about seven o'clock, he'd come around one evening, and we were gonna do some bass recording. And I sort of just said, oh, let me just put an oboe here. Let me just pop an oboe in this track. And I sort of thought, and then suddenly I, I looked across at him and I completely orchestrated this piece. And I, I looked at the time, it was 11 o'clock. And I went, oh, and he went, don't worry. I said, you've been sat there for four hours. He said, yeah. He said, I just, what? he said, you went into a trance. He said, it was really <laughs> bizarre. He said, you just hit a zone. Yeah. And it almost like everything flowed through you. He said, I couldn't have interrupted you if I tried. And it, it's almost like that songwriting at times. You just get into this bit where you're almost channeling stuff and it just can't, you know, you, you're, you're just there to, to get it down as quick as you can. So that piece was one of those sort of pieces where it just, everything felt right and it just flew you know uh so it's um so that one i sorry that all my answers will be about four times longer than you're expecting them to be and i'll probably end up answering <laughs> about three other like, questions on the way it's just like a prog rock epic it ends up being longer than people initially intend prog, prog, um, prog sentences that's, that's what we're yeah, calling. i love it um before <laughs> before we get into some yes talk i i see a question from someone in one of the groups I shared too. So th this is from John Niski, who says, I'd love to know what it was like working with the guys in Star Castle. I was at Rosfest when Oliver performed with them. It was a magical performance. Oh, oh yeah, that was that was lovely. That was um, that was quite a long time ago, actually. Yeah, yeah 2007. Of, yeah, I, I went over for sort of a little holiday and, and and they asked me to, to to join them on stage. And um, I didn't really know much about the band, but they sent me all these sort of materials to listen to. But they were they were great. I really enjoyed hanging out with them. And the show was really good fun. The show was, show was great fun. And, um, you know, I sort of, I still get emails. So I still keep in touch with Al Lewis, the singer, all the time. We're always talking about doing something together, and we probably will at some point. Um, but I sort of got on really well with them all. And as I sort of got to know them, you know, you really understood their musicality and that they, you know, I know a lot of people said they sounded like yes, and they, they were very <laughs> clever like yes. But they had, once you delved into the music, they did have their own sort of way of doing things that you spotted spotted patterns. Um, the best thing I remember about that was, I because nobody really knew what they looked like anymore because it had been such a long time since they'd played. And the, 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 the show was actually all the different um, sort of lineups of, of Starcast Law together. And the keyboard player couldn't do it, which is how I got suggested for it. And I remember saying to them, I said, is anybody up for having a laugh with this? And they sort of went, why? What are you, what are you planning on doing? I said, nobody knows what you look like. And they went, yeah. I said, why don't we queue up outside with the audience coming in? And they went, yeah, all right, we're up for that. And so we ended up <laughs> queuing up like a bunch of fans going in to watch the show. And as we all sort of walked in, and everybody sort of went to their seats. We just kept walking down through the middle and people were going, why aren't they going to seats? And then it sort of rippled that that <laughs> we were actually walking. We just walked up to the stage and started playing. That's great. <laughs> That's hilarious. Really good fun. Nice. And I think, and I seem to remember it's a show where I seem to remember the lighting guy went, had a had a problem on stage and we had to call the police. We had the police turn up halfway oh, wow. through the show. Hmm. It was a... Never had that before. That was a new one. Interesting. Yes. Not yeah. the band, the police, right? Not the band, no. They didn't try. <laughs> yeah, they show up <laughs> kicking in the door. <laughs> <laughs> this is our gig. <laughs> I, right. I'd like to um, jump to another video that you sent us um, that Steve and I are both fond of, not just the music, but it's always fun to watch, watch it being played. Um, talk about words from a page a little bit, and then we'll play that. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, the one you're probably going to play is the acoustic version, which is the piano version I put together for um, the Prog From Home concert, which was the first lockdown concert, I think, um, oh. that sort of sort of appeared. Yeah. It, when we first went into lockdown, it, it sort of 
I got approached, would I do it? And I thought, oh yeah, it's just gonna be a little thing. And it turned out to be this, you know, huge show that happened on the internet. We, we were watching it and it's like, you know, thousands upon thousands and thousands of people watching it as as it was all going on. It was, it was quite remarkable. Um, so I was obviously really chuffed to be asked to do it. And I sort of thought, what can I do? What can I do that will be a bit different? And I sort of thought, well, words on a page. I've been playing it myself anyway, just because, you know, I'd always been really fond of the, the melody. And it lent itself quite nicely because obviously it's originally a piano piece. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll do it for that one. Um, the track itself, back to the, the From the Page record, there's a couple of little interesting stories with that. Is the um, Obviously, the song is called Words on a Page. And it's when I wrote it, there was a couple of things I wanted to do. When I was writing, and this is before Trevor Horn got involved, but when I was writing songs, a management company, Yes Management, said to me, look, could you write lots of music for this Yes Yes record? Because, you know, you're quite prolific and I think it'd be good if we had lots of music to go for the new Yes record that we can we can listen to and work with. And I thought, okay, how am I going to do this? I want, I want to write for Yes. And I know that my keyboard style is going to match, but I wanted to make sure that we ended up it not just sounding like one of my like a solo record or a, a symphonic rock record or something from the other things i thought i've got to do this i want to make this authentic it's got to feel like a yes song and so i thought okay how would it be people are going to think they want to hear john singing so they're not going to hear john they can hear benoit and they're going to think about john's lyrics and i sort of thought well i can't just sit there and write i'm, I'm going to say this and this isn't in any other way lyrics that are difficult i was going to say nonsensical but that's not fair it's because they john's lyrics mean a lot to him but lyrics that are sometimes hard to interpret or understand why what the meaning is behind where he's coming from right. and i thought well if i just come up with things that try to sound like john it won't sound authentic but then i sort of i came i was sitting down and i was writing i was writing the word um dawns over mountains at night and i thought, I thought well, that's quite nice and I thought that does actually sound quite Johnish. And then I was sort of, and I sort of started the chorus lines, or words on a page. And I was just thinking about, them. and then I got this idea that actually this whole song could be about somebody reading a book and reading stories and how this world comes alive from words on a page. Because I love reading. I've always got a couple of books, a couple of sat over there actually ready for me to get going on. And I sort of thought, well, these, when you read a story, the one thing that's great about a book over a film is that the book is your imagination creating the scenery, the, the, the actors, the people, the players, everything. Whereas when you get a film, I mean, can you imagine Harry Potter looking any different to how he looks now in the films? You can't, but when the first <laughs> books came out, you probably imagined Harry Potter to be completely different right. to how he was in, in, the, in the film. And so I sort of thought, okay, but it's a story about writing, in fact, something from a book. And that almost gave me the free reign to come up with lots of John-like words and sentences that I could put together that weren't just me randomly coming up with things. And so that's where a lot of the lines come from. I'm trying to remember some of them now. Um, lost in the words on the page. Uh, like words, life forms between the lines. All that sort of stuff. Dawns over mountains at night. And those all come from things and phrases that you would read and experience that that could be more almost childlike mm -hmm. and so that's where the idea came from nice. uh, and then it developed really nicely and it started off we there's a demo version of it which has never been released which is really lovely because it's got different acoustic guitar different piano on it um chris just playing an acoustic bass and there's there's um doesn't go into the big second ending part at the end so it's just like a shorter instrument and that was how it was originally going to be and then um we were in the studio recording it and I remember Steve had his steel guitar on the side. And I sort of thought, okay, so I said, man, let's just play around the chords with a couple of key changes. And I said to Steve, would you do a solo? And he said, yeah, yeah, what do you want? And I'd written a little solo part for it on the guitar, because I, I play guitar, but no, nothing like Steve now, let's, let's be honest here. And, but I, I often go to Steve and say, there's like a couple of melodies into the moment, which are, which are mine on guitar. Because I'd say to him, I'll oh, just change that. And he'd say, why? And I said, well, because you're going to do it. He said, good melody, going to keep that. Uh, and so there's a couple of bits and words on the page did that. But then I said to him, I said, you wouldn't play your steel guitar, would you? Because he had his steel guitar from Andrew and I just on the side next to him in the studio. And he went, okay, yeah, okay, I can do that. And he came up with this solo that just blows me away every time I listen to it. And 
I remember thinking that was great. And then I wanted to do a section in there because I was trying to sort of think when we were recording, it's got to have what, what are the things that people sort of think about? Yes. And it's, it's like, well, steel guitar, the sort of anthemic endings, the gentleness, the fact that songs are almost written in lines rather than chords. You don't go on oh, C, right. F, D. No. It's like intertwining lines with the melody line overflowing. So I wanted to make sure that the music represented that bit that the band wrote in. Right. Um, and then, of course, when it got to the end, I said to everybody, let's do voices. You know, I was thinking back to things like Leave It and things like that, where you get multiple voices all stacked. And that's where we did the lines on a page. And I said, Chris and Steve, sing a line for me. And each take a different line. And we put it all together. And then Benoit sang this soaring line over the top. And the whole thing just built beautifully. And that, of and course, it, is a signature of Yes Music and has been forever. You know, the whole vocal aspect of it. Yeah, and I thought... Because we didn't have John, I didn't want, I, when I was putting that song together, I didn't want it to feel like something was missing. I wanted, you know, because Steve's got a very distinctive voice. Chris has got a very yeah. distinctive voice. My voice is, well, sounds like me, so I'm not going to say it's distinctive, but it sounds like me. But, and Benoit's voice is, is beautiful as well. Yeah. And those four voices working together were, were really nice. And it just felt, that song to me just, it just felt right. And when somebody once, I've read a review somewhere or somebody online once said that they, they said they loved that song and it just felt like a song that they could have picked up and put on a different Yes album from a different era. And I sort of took that as a, as a massive compliment. That was, that was sort of one of the nicest things somebody could have said to me. And, you know, that sort of made me think, okay, yeah, we got, we got that one pretty good. It, 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 it did have that Yes sort of feel to it, which was, which was really important. Right. Very nice. Let's play that. Uh, this is the solo acoustic version of Words on a Page. Oliver Wakeman, check this out, folks. entire prog from home stream was phenomenal i watched it when it came up a couple years ago and it was like a really nice thing for 
various prog musicians to get together in these uncertain times. Um, and I feel like with music, um, some people really love the more rocky, like hard edge songs, but I also really appreciate the hopeful and optimistic, gentler sounding ones. Like for example, anyone can fly over on Ravens and Lullabies. Yeah. Um, and words on the page, it's just like, whenever I think of that song, it doesn't take long for it to get stuck <laughs> in my head. And I, I just love that. The gift of love as well. Like I just love that type of music. Oh, good. That's, 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 that's very kind. Thank you. And, and yeah, two, two things. One, I feel extremely underdressed, <laughs> but at least it's music related. Two, Absolutely. Two, my dog is going nuts. I want to make sure everything's okay. You two carry on. I'll be right back. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, getting back to yes, uh, you're uh, actually the first yes keyboardist I saw in concert. Uh, me oh, really? My yeah, me and my dad um, went to see Yes and Asia back in 2009 in Las Vegas, and it's just such a great show. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember that show. I do remember that one. Yeah, I can't remember what, what, what was the venue called? I think it was the Thomas and Max Center. That was it, yes, yes. Yeah, we stayed in the Pyramid Building, if I remember correctly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, the, the year before, we were going to try to go to the close to the edge and back tour which of course was before benoit joined and yeah. when john was slated to uh come and sing for the band but of course we all know what happened uh one of the things i've been long curious about was the set list like were there any set list changes between that canceled tour and the in the present tour that might surprise people uh, I think we were going to do a few more, um, a few more other well. I think we, one thing I never did on the in the present was wondrous stories, and we were going mm. to do that one definitely. I was pushing John quite a lot to do it. I've always had a real soft spot for Holy Lamb. I've always oh, loved, oh wow, always, that's one of Steve's favorite songs. Always yeah. wondrous <laughs> stories is like my wife and I song. Yeah, I always always loved Holy Lamb, and I was saying to John. Should we should we do that? And he was like, you know, well, it's not the, really the lineup. And I said, well, and he wanted to do a little acoustic section in the middle. And he said, well, you and I will do it. We'll do it together. <laughs> so, is any lineup the lineup? I mean, who knows? it's kind of an odd response, don't you think, Oliver? Well, I think he was sort of thinking that Steve probably wouldn't want to play Trevor's guitar bits, and mm. you know, would I would I play the Tony K keyboard bit or you know? Yeah. I'd love to. I think it was great, great song. I always thought it was a lovely, a lovely track. I mean, I, you know, I see a lot of these things online where people talk about their favorite Yes albums and stuff, but I always liked Big Generator and I always thought that was a lovely mm. way to end, end that record. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I was always sort of looking forward to playing that with John. Um, and we did a few other bits and pieces as well. I'm trying, trying to know what it was. Cause yeah, I, I know that back in the day, John was saying, oh, maybe we'll do nine voices or do revealing signs of God in the acoustic session. Um, oh, and... yeah, we were going to do something from Magnification, I think we were going to do as well. Oh, wow. Oh, really? I seem to remember something along the lines for that, but I can't exactly remember which one it was. God, it was a long time ago, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy yeah, how time flies. I, I think... Yeah, I think he mentioned Give Love Each Day, and he was saying it'd be cool to do that with the Paul Green's School of Rock All-Stars on stage, but I don't know like how um, how set in stone he was about the idea or if he was saying that would be a cool thing to do type of thing. Yeah, I could, really couldn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he was right. Like, oh, go ahead, Oliver. No, 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 I was only going to say because it was very... um because John was very much taking the lead on that tour. Because Steve asked me, right. you know, phoned me up and said, would I join? And I said, yeah. And um, and then when John and I spent a lot of time talking, we did a bit of recording, some ideas backwards and forwards. And he sent me some other songs, some new songs that we were going to look at doing. And um, and then obviously he, he got ill. And, and so I hadn't really spoken to Steve or Chris or Alan throughout that whole period, really. It was just John and I talking all the time. And... Um, and then I remember when John got sick, he just wrote to me and he said, I'm sick, it's not going to happen. 
Mm. And I was like, sort of obviously very upset for John. Uh, right. But then as part of me, but I went, oh, that's really disappointing. And I thought, oh, great. I'm going <laughs> to, the only person that's been in Yes for a year and not played a note with them. This <laughs> just mm. felt really, just felt really sort of wrong. Yeah. And um, I thought, oh, well, at least I've been asked. That was, that's, that's nice. And then Steve sort of, phoned me up a bit later and said, look, we're working, you know, we've got Benoit, are you still on board? And I said, well, yeah. And that's when we started talking about the next set list where we we went through stuff. The, the difficulty with the, the set list, from my point of view, when we went on In the Present was um, really the amount of material I had to learn. Because I, I, you know, probably what, what people don't realise is mm -hmm. I hadn't spent my whole life growing up learning Yes songs or Dad's music, even though I sort of grew up with it. I listened to it like a fan, but I didn't really sit there and go, oh, so what's going on here? So suddenly being given three and a half hours worth of music to learn was quite a lot. Um, so I had to learn all this stuff. But the the hardest bit was when when it got to playing live, I thought, okay, how can I approach this that is going to be authentic to, to the fans and I can bring something, what can I bring to the band that I can bring to the band? And I sort of looked at a lot of the live videos and I noticed that a lot of the solos, Dad would make up his own solos for and change solos and do them differently. And I sort of talked to Steve about it and I said, look, it would be, you know, what do you think about if I go back and do all the authentic original solos, you know, the original solo from Andrew and I, the original solo from Close to the Edge. And, and he was like, yeah, we've been thinking exactly the same. We want to take the band right back and do it really authentic because nice. it's, it's changed so much over the years. I said, okay, great. I'll get the records, I'll sit down, I'll work out all the music. And he went, brilliant. And I said, okay, so anything else you'll be aware of? And he went, oh yeah, we have made some arrangement changes over the years, but we want to keep those in place. And I was like, okay. So there's like certain bars cut out close to the edge and there's bits in roundabout where, you know, the, the theme changes underneath the chorus line and then you do the da -da -da, da -da 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 stuff going on underneath. And it's, yeah. I went, okay, is there any recordings of, of it authentically played with those arrangement changes. He went, no. I went, okay. So I had to sort of learn the pieces twice. I had to learn yeah. them the live way and learn them originally and then... Apply the original to the newly yeah. reworked version. Yeah. yeah, and that was it. And of course, you're playing over something where someone else is playing something different when you're trying to work it out. So it was really quite complex. And then, of course, you know, I turned up in Hamilton, which is where we started rehearsing. And we had two weeks of rehearsal. I had a brand new keyboard rig. I hadn't played with the band before. Um, and it was quite daunting, the amount of material we had to get through. And I thought, it's okay. It's all right. If we start at eight every morning and go through till five, we've got two weeks for the first show. I think we can pull it together. And then, um, you know, Chris, I, I don't think it's the secret that Chris sort of is a late timekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> And he would say, okay, unless he's wearing so, a base, <laughs> unless he's wearing, and he would say to me, he'd say, um, all right, okay, so we'll 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 start at one, and I was like, that's five hours of the day gone, and then he'd go, and then we'll stop for a bit of lunch at about three, and then we'll we'll you know we'll call it a day by about five. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah, is this so why the first to... six shows were only a half hour long? That'll be it. Yeah. <laughs> what so was? What I used to, I used to go in really early and just sit and with the keyboard rig and just play and play. And then we used to rehearse and then that used to finish. And then I used to go back to my room and sit with the keyboard and just play and play and just try to, it was just try to learn as much of this material in, 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 in the, the period of time that we had. Um, and then I was thought, we were doing really well. I thought this is really coming together. And I thought, right, we've got two days. And then, then Chris said, I think we're going to take Thursday off. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. That's yeah. great. Out of respect well, for your time, we're going to scoot through some some more fun questions and whatever we don't get to, we'd love to have you on again sometime. Oh, happy to. Happy to. So you and Steve have something very much in common, even more so than I have in common with Steve. Steve, why don't you <laughs> pop that question? Yeah, so I heard that a certain someone is a Frasier fan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you have a favorite episode? Do I have a favorite episode? Um, yes, I have. Oh, blah, it's such a, I, I love that show. I, it's, yeah, it's tough to choose. <laughs> it is tough to choose. I Probably the one 
where Niles hires the the man that sorts out the problems for his wife's parking tickets. Oh, yeah. I absolutely love that effort. I can watch that one over and over again. I just where he starts, you know, <laughs> trying to <laughs> trying to talk tough guy. I just it's hysterical. Absolutely, I absolutely love that episode. But there's probably about a hundred others that I could mention as well. But that one always always comes back. back How about you, me. Steve? What's your favorite? It would probably have to be one of the episodes where, you know, Fraser's dad, Martin, like has some really good advice and stuff like that. Like, I really like the one where he kind of puts Fraser and Niles in their place when they're talking smack about this steak restaurant. He's saying, yeah, your, your mother could appreciate a good ball game. She wouldn't treat anyone second rate. Um, yeah. But I also love the one where you know, it's, I mean, spoilers for a later season of Frasier, I guess, but it, it always hurts to see the chair fall and like knowing that it's not the same chair the rest of the show, but it's also really heartwarming seeing Frasier want to get a replica of it made for his dad because like he finally understands like how much it means to him. Yeah, yeah, that was a good episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Who's your favorite character, Oliver? Do you have a favorite character? That's hard so, to narrow down as well. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It's, I just, I think what it is, I just think they're such a strong ensemble. Yeah. yeah. I think that is the, that is the heart of the show, isn't it? it? It really is. If you get a good ensemble of characters, you can have an episode where you, you suddenly think, oh, that's my favorite character. I love the way that, but then you go to another episode and the other character will, will warm you know, so it's, it's very difficult because I would pick somebody, you know, if I if I say, like I said, my favourite episode, I think Niles has some of the best lines in that episode. Yeah. But then there's other episodes where where Frasier has some amazing lines and you go, oh, this character's the best one. And then you'll do things with Daphne or or, or Roz, some of her cover, and you just sort of go, or Martin, and, it, and you sort of think, nah, it's just, it's the fact it's an ensemble and they work so well together is what makes it it makes it so strong. So I, I agree with that. And what I'm going to say can absolutely apply to any of the other characters. However, at a whole next level, I cannot imagine seeing someone else play Niles besides <laughs> David Hyde Pierce. It's like that's he just comes to life so much that you don't have to suspend any disbelief. That guy is that guy. It's just hilarious yeah. how neurotic and conceited he is. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a couple of um, this is how much of a nerd I am for for Frasier stuff. There is there's a hidden Frasier episode in Wings. Did you know that? Oh yeah, I've heard of it, it's, but it's, I haven't it's, gotten I, around to seeing it yet. I don't know if it. I know that. That's interesting. We should watch it's, that, Steve. It's, yeah, it's 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 Frasier and Lilith doing a seminar to the Wings cast. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, yeah, we got to check that out. That's and great. and and the end of. Caroline in the city. There's a cameo from Niles and Daphne. Oh, that one I did not know about. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't um, remember that. That's great. We got to check that yeah, stuff out. Some yeah, nice yeah, Easter find, eggs. Find that. That's see what I mean. I'm terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's one for you. Um, you're tall. You're t how tall are you? Uh, six two, six three, something okay. like that. Six two, I think. I'm getting older, so I'm getting shorter. My son's just got taller than me, so I think he tells me how short I am now. <laughs> nice. So when is it uncomfortable when you're under the stage actually playing when your dad is miming? And do they bring you snacks when he's doing the talking parts between songs? Which bit are you talking about? When your dad's pretending to be playing, but you're actually under the stage all crammed up down there, oh. actually being the one playing. <laughs> Very good. Sorry, it took me a moment there. Getting late here. Yeah. No, but seriously, what is your, um, what's your affinity with gear? Where does it lie? Like, do you, do, have you ever delved into the old school Hammond B3s with the Leslie Dopplers? You know, do, do you get into some of the old gear with any of your recordings or playing live? Yeah, uh, live not so much because uh, I have practical. done, but they're a pain in the neck. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my little Moog Little Fatty is, is lovely. It's hidden up the top up there. Um, but, 
you know, even that with its digital stuff and it still would go out of tune every now and then and would be a pain when you're playing. I used to have two, actually. They they did the stage one and the stage two of the little fatties, one which had a silver back and one which had a black back. Mm. And I used to have two because if you played, um, you had to get the temperature right. So if you played outside, having the silver backed one was better because it would reflect the light. Oh, and the heat. It, yeah. Uh, whereas if you were playing in a cold outside show, having using the black one to absorb more heat was better. So, you know, you had those sort of things. To think. So they became really hard work. Um, but the Three Ages of Magic album, just to go back to the collaborations box set, mm -hmm. that is full of stuff like that. There's old, yeah. old upright pianos. There's a lovely Hammond on there. It was, it was recorded in the southwest of England, in Cornwall, right down on the tip of, of, of the west coast of England. I recorded that album in an old farm. There's a studio built in the middle of this huge barn. So the whole barn is literally just old, like an old, you know, working barn with this studio and control room in the middle of it. And I, I had the whole barn full of keyboards, big keyboard rig in there. The Hammond speakers, you know, Leslie speakers were, were rattling around with yeah. microphones all around the room. And it was amazing. And the sounds that we could get from that was terrific. And I used... I didn't, the Moog Little Fatty hadn't come out then, so I was using an old Yamaha CS1, which is a single oscillator yeah. keyboard, like a, like a Moog, but only single oscillator. So I'd have to play the solo a couple of times and then detune it to get the same effect as a, as a Moog. Right. But this farm, when we recorded it, we listened back to it and you could hear the keyboard going, diddly diddly, and then you'd hear tick, a diddly diddly tick, diddly diddly tick. And it was like, we couldn't work out where this, ticking noise was coming from on the take. And eventually we worked out what it was. This farm was actually a working farm as well. It's a dairy farm. Is someone shoe on a horse? No, it was the electric fence to keep the cows in. <laughs> oh, <wow>. So <laughs> the voltage from the keyboard was picking up the, the cycle of the electricity going through. So to do the solo, we had to turn off all the electric fences in the farm and hope that the cows didn't get Wouldn't out. get loose. That's hilarious. So the, the engineer, who was also the owner of the farm, was saying to me, please get it right in one take, he said, because if I lose a load of cows, I'm in all sorts of trouble. Oh, my gosh. Now, conversely, another gear question, and then I have one more. Conversely, if you were called to show up at the studio for a gig that they didn't have time to tell you anything about and you needed to just bring one keyboard to have as much of what you like at the ready, what would that keyboard be? Well, I've got a called called Kronos here next to me, mm -hmm. which I haven't played a great deal, but everything in it seems to be wonderful. So if I'd actually delved into that properly, I would probably have said that. Yeah. But I do have um, a Korg M3, which has been my saviour on multiple occasions. I mean, I've, this this thing here is a, a Dexibel H7, which is a fantastic um, electric piano. Absolutely love that. But right. I think the M3 was such a good workhorse. It, years before that, I would have said my Korg T1 because my Korg T1 came everywhere with me. I did everything on that keyboard. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up with the M3, which was a really, really well-crafted keyboard. It had some really lovely sounds. It didn't have such great pianos, but everything else on it was just amazing. And I could do lots and lots of stuff on the show with that. Um, so probably the, the M3 is something that I would always pick up and use. But... I tended to get to um, I tended to get to the point where I ended up buying keyboards that were really good at one thing. So, you know, I would always take out like on my Yes rig, I always had like a Yamaha piano because it just did the piano. And then I yeah. had the organ because it just did the organ. I had mm -hmm. the little vocoder that just did the voice bits for for uh, Tempest Fusion. Yeah, and I had the Moog, and then I had the the little uh, what was it? Roland D. Uh, Roland. Uh, I can't remember what it was now. I've got two of them. Why can't I remember what it's called? XP, XP30. Had a couple of those because they just did really beautiful strings. And so I ended up having like compartmentalized, a bit like an orchestra. It's like I went here for this, I went there for that. But the M3 was like my sort of, I had an M3 and a, and a Triton, and they both were like workhorses that could yeah. pick up the strain of all the other bits that were acquired around the more um, uh, sort of authentic vintage gear yeah. sounds. Um Nice. So, so, so that was that was sort of how I tend to work now. But um, yeah, I've said that. I, I'm trying to think what else I've got that I tend to what I would take out. I 
do you know, I'll go into the garage tomorrow and I'll look and I'll see something. I go, why didn't I say that one? That would, that does the job just as well. <laughs> it's I, always I, fun I, to geek out on gear, you know. And, yeah. And my last question in that that realm is, what software do you prefer to use when it comes to recording and editing and everything? Uh, Pro Tools I generally Pro use. Tools? Uh, and I, I was originally Cubase back in the days when it was all MIDI. And yeah. um, because I was working in a studio to do Jabberwocky and things, I bought my first Mac. I bought the G3, the little blue and white G3 yeah. tower when it first came that. out. And um, and then I sort of, and I got Cubase and I became quite a convert and I became, you know, sort of Mac everything. And then when it got to the point where I needed to start doing more audio recording, Cubase wasn't very good at that at the time. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to make a jump to something that does audio. And I think it was an engineer I was working with said, you should give, give Pro Tools a try. And it was a, it was a difficult jump to jump from Cubase to, to Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I did that. And now I'm, I sort of feel really, really comfortable with it. I feel, I'm not the world's greatest sort of um, mixer. I can mix things, but I always go to Carl Groom because he does everything that I do because he's just brilliant. But I can do enough to get things to a point. I mean, I worked with with Gordon. Gordon was sort of like, right. Gordon would just watch me and just go. He said, "You're so quick," and it's just like, well, I know people that are even quicker than me at recording bits and pieces down. But it's, I was always sort of taught as an engineer is that you just try and record quickly. So when Gordon was there playing, it was like, get it in, go, go again, go again. You don't, I, I don't like sitting in a studio and someone says, "Oh, just give me a minute. I've just got to do a couple of things." You don't want to stop the musician, yeah. so. Pro Tools allowed me to get that sort of speed of being able to record ideas down. I don't want to be, I don't want to be sort of um, inhibited by the by the technology. The yeah, technology you don't want your flow and creativity done. interrupted. Yeah. And Pro Tools seems to work quite nicely. The amount of times I'm sitting here recording and I just go over here, hit the number three, da 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 da. da. No, it's not work. Space number three, da 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 da, and that just works for me. And it's that's nice because I'm all about getting the ideas down or the thoughts down. That's that's the yeah. most important thing. No, no one wants to listen to a record for how well it was recorded at, at the time. If the songs are no good or the music's no good, it doesn't matter how well the record's recorded. Right, absolutely. And if you have just a few more minutes, a couple yeah, more yeah, minutes. No, yeah, I'm okay. good. It's all, it's Steve all has some, uh, a few more miscellaneous musical questions for you. Right, so what music do you listen to in your free time these days? And is there anything that would surprise people? Um, what would surprise people? I don't know. you know, musicians get known for, well, they must listen to stuff like what they play, but that's not always the case. Okay. No, I, I have a few albums that I always find myself going back to, which is um, Omadorn by Mike Oldfield just find oh. myself listening to that all the time for some reason. I just, something about it, I just really, really enjoy that record. Um, I'll, I'll listen to a, a wide variety of music. I'm a bit like most people, a bit magpie-ish, you know, I listen to some heavy rock stuff, not, you know, almost thrash metal at times, down to uh, Chopin or Grieg. It depends what sort of mood I'm in, but I have a few sort of few bands that I've always really sort of warmed to. And I don't know whether that's because that's how I grew up or bands that sort of had a, an important part as I was growing up. So Deep Purple were a huge band for me when I was growing up. Yeah, Absolutely me too. Absolutely huge band for me. Loved that. Um, and, and then from and then I went into It Bites. I really enjoyed It Bites work, particularly the uh, Eat Me and St. Louis album. Absolutely loved that record. Yeah. Dan Reed Network, the first two records were just such an important part of my my life sticks were the big one for me oh, strangely nice. enough sticks were just my when i first got my first record player at player at about 12 my mum went into the loft she said your dad had some records that he left behind and she gave them to me and it was like six wives and there was tales from topographic oceans and they uh, and then there was the grand illusion by sticks with a a and m demonstrator sticker on the front nice. and i put that on and i must have listened to the song miss america yeah. A hundred times, just over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, and it sticks. It. Yeah. It does. Such a big yeah. sound for back then, too. It was such a great record. I love every every bit on that record. And then I sort of I I sort of really fell for the songwriting styles of Tommy, Jane, JY, and Dennis DeYoung. And I love the fact that Dennis DeYoung was a keyboard player but could rock out and write songs like 
rock in the paradise. I love the fact that a keyboard yeah. player could, could write hard edge stuff as well. Uh, and he was a big influence on me um, as well because it made me, you know, because I grew, grew up with sort of the yes stuff and the complex stuff and and then Deep Purple sort of rocking out. But Dennis DeYoung and Styx had a way of almost packaging prog in a, in not quite shorter form, but in a, a, a more way digestible it, form, I think, I think for a, the average yeah. music fan. I think that's a really good description, actually. Yeah. And, and I really went for that. And I have, I can't say I've got every Styx record, but I, I pretty much have most of them. Um, and I, I love, I love all of them. Uh, you know, and then I like all the offshore offshoots, like Shaw Blades and yeah. Damn Yankees and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I'm, a, there's one record that, probably you might, you may have heard of actually but it's one of my favorites i listen to all the time is um an album called haunted by poe yeah which yeah. is a lovely album i did listen to that all the time as well and that is a wonderfully produced record with some amazing songs and she's a terrific singer and then i'll listen to people like suzanne vega i love mm -hmm. that i love that sort of sort of new york singer songwriter type thing and then i'll change from that and i'll go and listen to someone else uh, it just, I'm, I'm quite eclectic i'm you know I, I think the only difficulty is is that as i get older my son keeps saying to me oh listen to this dad and i sort of feel really mean but i sort of say to him i don't know how many years i've got left if i'm going to listen to something i'm going to sort of listen to a record by somebody from a band that i like and something of theirs that i haven't right. listened to before rather than go and listen to somebody brand new how, um, how old is your son 16. Six. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So he's just getting to, to that age. So what we generally do is whenever whenever we go out in the car, down to the shops or something, I will just cherry pick a track for him. So you have a listen to this. And the other day it was um, it was White Russian by Marillion. I made him listen to. Oh, wow, and yeah. In Communicado. And he was like, oh, these, these are pretty cool. And I played him um, some Dream Theater from Images and Words. And he, he thought that was pretty cool. And That's cool. Yeah. It's funny, uh, Steve literally... <laughs> came out of the womb as a Yes fan, literally. Oh, wow. <laughs> but now, um, decades later, he, he still is. But now he turns me on to music. And so I live in Arizona, and I have daughters in Oregon. And we drove from Arizona to Steve's house in Bakersfield, spent the night, and then drove to Oregon for Thanksgiving, drove back. And all that time, he brought a bunch of stuff, and most of it I had never heard of. And one of the things he turned me on to that I just find romantically enchanting is the chromatics. And it's, oh, okay. it's quite different from most of the stuff I listen to. And um, so you never know where where some gems are going to come from. They could come from no. the generation the above you, the generation below you. You never know. <laughs> no, that's true. The one thing that we do, which is uh, uh, something that people don't know about me, is I'm actually quite a big Harry Connick Jr. fan as well. Oh, me uh, too. My wife, yeah. oh, yeah. My wife's a huge jazz aficionado, and we yeah. love the modern style sort of big band. Yeah, hair yeah. is amazing. Yeah. yeah, and I remember we were on tour with Yes, and somebody said to me, Harry Connick Jr.'s just gone that way. And I sort of thought, I've got to go and say hello. You know, it, yeah. he, he won't know me. He probably doesn't know anything about Yes, but I thought, I'll, I'll go up and meet and I was quite prepared. He wasn't in the, the gate where we were. He was going on a different flight. I was quite prepared to miss the flight and go and find his, his <laughs> gate and chat to him, but I couldn't find him anywhere, unfortunately. Oh, Looking so here's out. a Harry Connick Jr. trivia question for you, Oliver. Oh. Do you know what animated film he did a leading voice for? Do you know what I did? And now I can't remember. Oh. Now, I, I could. I, I remember watching a film with my son when he was younger and going, oh, Harry Connick Jr. did the voice for that. And now I can't remember which one it is. Remind me. Do you remember, Steve? Yeah, it's the Iron Giant. It's one of my favorites. Yes, yes, that's it. Yes, yeah. so I, I, don't, I don't remember. I was, I was trying to go through, is it a Pixar one? I was doing all those. I was sort of going, which Pixar films did he make me watch? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was so cool when I saw that. Um, what? Tell us your favorite you may have answered this in a way earlier, but tell us your favorite Yes album that your father played on and your favorite Yes album that he's not on. Okay. That's a. Yeah, you got your bases one. covered, so there's no family awkwardness. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry about that. <laughs> I'm not worried about that at all. Um, favorite one that he's on. 
you know, I, I should, Fragile, I love. I mean, I love Fragile, Close to the Edge, Going for the One. I think they're all amazing records. It's funny, I was waiting for you to say Relayer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he used to sign, whenever he signed, whenever people was given Relayer to sign, he used to sign it, not invited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 when I talked about these record players, that my mum gave me a record and gave me the records, one of the ones she gave me was um, Going for the One. And so that was the one that I started listening to. I'm going to be really weird here. Tomato was the one that I really loved. I absolutely loved Tomato. And everybody sort of thinks I'm really weird for that because everyone just goes, but close to the edge, but fragile. And, you know, <laughs> fragile, I have a soft spot because I'm named in the book clip because it was done just before I was, I was born. And right. uh, I was born whilst dad was on tour with I it. remember that. Yeah, new offspring um, on the way. Yeah, yeah. I remember. And, um, but then I remember going to, um, it's probably the, it depends on which yes camp you fall into, but I listened to the ABWH album an awful lot because I was around the age. It came out in 88, I was about 16. So I was really getting into that sort of music at the time. And for a new record to come out and to be current and to go and buy the 12 inch and find the hidden track of Vultures in the City and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. As an older person, now I listen to that record and compare it and I think, no, it's not as in-depth as going for the one or even tomato or close to the other. But it kind of has an affinity for me because I spent I went out on the tour with dad for that and I got to know Steve very well. So no. probably from a sort of experience point of view, ABWH is the record that really, you know, connected me with the band. Um, and going for the one is the one that I remember my mum giving me. And but tomato was the one that dad when I used to go and stay with my dad at the weekends, there was a copy of Tomato up with a record player near a little snooker table he had. And I used to just put it on over and over and over again. It's a bit like the Frasier thing, which is your favorite. They work as an ensemble. And depending on what sort of mood I'm in, I, yeah. I go to go to so different ones. I have to throw this in there and interrupt the, the before you answer the next part of that. Yeah, Steve and I both love Tomato. It's the first tour that I saw. And, and I saw the first leg and the second leg. And it's also my choice for my birthday is April 2nd. And I'm going to play on Drum Talk TV. I'm going to perform one song from 25 of my top influences. And the yes selection I chose is because Bill and Alan are huge influences. I've known Alan since 89. I chose to play Future Times and Rejoice as the yes piece. Oh, okay. And I'm yeah. honoring Bill with some King Crimson and, and stuff. But um, And then uh, a friend of ours who has another Yes podcast, it's his f ultimate favorite Yes oh, album. Yeah. And the yes, yes Music podcast. The yes Oliver's Music been on podcast. It. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> uh, we have to ask, since you brought that up, do you know whether or not the story is true that it was your dad that threw the tomato at the artwork of the album cover? <laughs> oh, do you know, I wish I could answer it for you. I don't. Okay. I don't I don't know that. Although a little related story is when Gordon and I were working together, um, we toured with another great English band called Barclay James Harvest that you may have heard of. Um, and we toured with them. And while we were doing the tour, we I started to do my usual silly things, which is come up with silly ideas. We had to drive from one gig to another and we had some time in between. And they said, oh, where should we stop on the way? And we were going past Stonehenge. So we stopped at Stonehenge and we had a photograph. And I started doing tweets and I started doing, you know, we, we used to call it, um, you know, the, the, the prog, prog cliches. We hashtag prog cliches. We do that. Prog oh, that's bands, perfect. Sort of Stonehenge. Stuff. And we, we did it all the time. We went to Abbey Road. We did uh, where Sid Barrett was born. We did all oh, wow. this. We went to the, we went to the ceramic uh, cows from Atom Heart Mother, all this sort of stuff. Wow. And we did all the things. And one of the things that we did when we went down to Devon was we drove past Yes Tour. Oh, wow. And oh, wow. So I got the whole band to go up and we stood there in exactly the same pose. I put the glasses on. Oh, With dark wow. glasses. And um, yeah, and we did that. And then we did the photo. We did this photograph. And then before the show for the prog cliche, I went back and put it into Photoshop, made it all blue like the hypnosis version. And then found a picture of a tomato smashed and just threw that onto the picture as well. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> so, that is perfect. 
No. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll find it off my Twitter account. I'll retweet it tonight for people to people to see it. But that, yeah, send so it to us, please, and we'll put it up to promote a replay of the interview. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. So, I don't know if he did do it, but I'm. Yeah. That's great. That's, yeah, that we've my heard that. I've heard that it. since it came out. So I don't. We don't know. What's your favorite album by Yes that your father is not on, and that you're not on either? That he's not on. That I'm not on. Okay. Um, to do, to, to, to. Do you know what sort of part of me wants to say 90125 because it was probably when it again when I was about 16 it was a sort of one I I, I found um but there was there's something about big generator and I know people are just going to go you played in yes and you're picking tomato and big generator what is wrong with you um <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with that they they put it out so what could be wrong with it you know with yeah, that I th I, th I think it was I just, I just really liked, I just like the, I just like the aggression, I think, in that. In I was going to ask if it was the heaviness element. Yeah, I think I kind of, because I was at that sort of age and it was like, you know, 90125 was really clean cut and beautifully right. done. There's a bit but of grunge I, element with Big Generator. I think it was. And, and Chris yeah, doing point. those really low D tune. Dun, dun, yeah. Dun, dun. All that sort of stuff really, I thought, I thought was, was great. And, um, you know, there was the poppier stuff like Love Will Find a Way and stuff, but there's, you know, Big Generator itself who was a was such a cool and shoot high aim low. I always really loved as a, yeah. as a track as, as as well. So I I think I, I think there's that one that I, I would probably if I had to pick out a record now and just go on oh, gonna listen to some yes, what should I pick out? I'd probably pick out, you know, Tomato or or Big Generator. Um I know I should be saying relayer or something that made people just go, yes, yes, that's quite right. Two years, but I just, <laughs> no, you, you got you got to be true to yourself. Like, don't give in to the popular opinion and what they assume. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like like I was ten when I first listened to t the Tormato album, and up to that point, the only Tormato songs I'd heard elsewhere were Onward and On the Silent Wings of Freedom. So yeah. when I listened to the CD for the first time, I was just immediately blown away by Future Times. And it was just like, wow, all this is so much new Yes music to me. And it even had like all those bonus tracks. So it was like a lot of newness for me yeah. to experience. Yeah, no, it, it just, I know people will say that on, on Tomato. I think what it is, is people sort of say about tomatoes, there's lots of fighting going on. They were all sort of fighting for space mm. and arguing over mixing and a big generator. I know they sort of started with Trevor and then fell out and he went and they carried on. So yeah, I don't know whether it's, I just sort of hear that in the records, but I, I kind of quite like that sort of that dueling side of things. But um, yeah, something about those I just like, but you know, yeah, they're great records, but even yeah. the other ones that I could pick are all great records as well. And and I, 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 I maybe the reason I've gone for those those two is possibly because we didn't play any of them on tour. Whereas the other ones I played quite quite in depth. You know, you, you know when you when you have to sort of play these pieces on stage, you really have to pull them to pieces and analyze them and and. and pull them apart and rebuild them almost and because we didn't really we, we did onward um but we didn't do anything else from tomato and we didn't do anything from from big generator they sort of still have an element of mystery to me i'm still listening to it as a block of sound rather than thinking oh yes and that's what i did on close to the edge and oh yes i my daughter we have to have she loves south side of the sky from live in leon we have it in the car all the time oh wow nice and and I sort of listen to it because I have to listen to it like five times every morning on the way to school and five times on the way back. <laughs> it's like if you it, eat enough chocolate cake, you'll decide it's not your favorite cake, right? Yeah, it, it's, that, it's that sort of thing. And I sort of think to myself, you know, I can hear myself working out the bits that I had to play and I think, oh, I remember working that bit out. I remember doing that and that bit and then we did this and then we did that. And that kind of... It, it's wonderful to be the person up on stage playing them but it, it's not the same experience as hearing a piece of music performed to you. And I think maybe that's why those two records still, for me, have an air of mystery that I haven't pulled them apart. And I think right. that's maybe, maybe, maybe that's part of the reason as well over time that they've, they've still strayed sort of slightly mysterious to me. That yeah. makes what, sense. What well, was your favorite Yes song to perform live? Um, 
I love playing Heart of the Sunrise. I know that sounds quite mm. trite Ooh. because it, it, it's played so often, but it's such a, it's quite a complex piece. Yeah, it has a little of uh, everything, it, really, dynamically it, and time changes, everything. Yeah. And it's, um, I, it's, it's also not, it's one of those pieces as well that you sort of, it's really interesting in the way that it's it's rooted slightly differently because everybody in the band takes a, a turn at being the person in control. Uh, and that was always good fun to play. And it's quite challenging as well. It's particularly challenging when you are, um, when you're playing on, on stage and with the S music, because you're reliant on, because everyone's playing lines and the timings are all, you know, quite complex timings. You really have to be on your, you have to be on your guard because if suddenly someone's instrument cuts out or you don't hear it in your monitors or it gets lost or there's a pop from the speakers or something and you miss something, you you you, have, you almost have to have, you almost have to have backup plans in your head is the best way I can describe it. Like if you, you, know, you want to go fly, you want to fly somewhere, you always make sure you've got the backup flight as well so you can still get wherever you need to go. Right. It's a bit like that. If you're playing and suddenly you can't hear something, you go, okay, I can't hear Steve. Why can't I hear Steve? What? And you're listening for a cue. You're like, okay, what's right. my backup plan? Okay, I listen to when the bass drum hits three and I wait for Chris to hit that IC. And then I go to my part. It was that sort of thing with Yes stuff. So it was quite it was quite complex. And Heart of the Sunrise was a lot of that because there's a lot of stuff where Steve and I, you know, you know, we sync together and there's sections where the keyboards are just on their own. Close to the Edge was always great fun. Um always great fun to do the organ solo and that sort of big church organ bit in the middle it was great fun to play always used to like playing um uh, astral traveler was always good fun to play oh nice oh, yeah because yeah. because you know because it hadn't been played before yeah. and i suppose in an odd sort of way that was quite a new piece to all of us because they hadn't played it for years either right. so it was quite quite nice that we were all sort of discovering it together yeah and i remember i remember chris and i we were playing it, and, you know, as we would go through the tour, we'd keep refining and we'd keep doing bits and we'd keep doing, keep doing bits. And I remember Chris saying to me once, he said, why do you go to a C on that run-up? I said, because that's what Tony Kay did. He went, are you sure? I said, yeah, yeah, Chris, he would go up to a C. And he went, he said, I finished on B. I said, no. Well, it goes to C on the, on the record. And we both were convinced, and we'd listen to the record. And they are slightly out, and it was oh, actually wow. um, so we actually sort of, sort of refined back from original things. It was just you know, just an example of Chris's amazing memory. He could he could remember everything and anything except um, to be on time. Except to be on time, <laughs> yes. But that that was so. Astral Traveler was always good fun. But I mean, to be honest with you, I loved I loved the whole set. It just went so quickly. It, you know, once you've got it under your fingers, um, and I also always really liked playing um, Perpetual Change. Well, oh, if you that's get that, correct. You get yeah. that middle. You get that middle section just right of the, the the shift between the two pieces. Yeah, we we had a way of doing that, and that was can't remember what it was now, but that was always great fun to play. And you'd sort of come out of the other side of that, and you'd give yourself a little mental pat on the back. You sort of go, oh, not individually as a band, yeah. you'd go, oh, mentally, yeah, we did yeah. that. We did that well. We we came together really well through that. So that's that was great. good fun. But you know. Nice. The, the least favorite song to play on a yes show is still a great song and it's still a yes yeah. show. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Well, Oliver, thanks so much for taking time, especially on a Saturday evening. We really appreciate so much more to talk about. We'd love to have you on again sometime if you're up yeah. to putting up with us again. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, we could go on for hours. So yeah, no, invite invite me back and we can we can talk more sitcom stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Hang on the line with us for just a moment after we say goodbye. Thank you, everybody, so much for following Yes Shift with Steve and I and for watching with our guest Oliver Wakeman today. Share this with someone who you think would dig it and, of course, your fellow Frasier fans. We'll see you again <laughs> soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>